It seems to me that the main um, reason for the differences between Wojtyla and von Hildebrand have to do with the fact that von Hildebrand gives the emotional sphere a much more uh, elevated rank, a much more elevated place in his uh, view of the person, or vice versa, that Wojtyla gives the emotions a much lower rank in the makeup of the person. As we saw, as I hope become, became clear from what I said earlier, um, for Wojtyla, sensual and emotional experiences become, you could say, genuinely personal realities only through the forming and directing activity uh, of the will. By themselves, they are the raw material, uh, the origin for love, but not yet uh, love in any sense uh, uh, by themselves. So, And he stresses especially the passivity of these emotions. They don't orig originate from our free personal center. And he mentions also that they don't yet reach the person qua person. I tried to bring that out also earlier. They don't reach the individual. The, the incomparable, incomparable um, thisness, the unrepeatability of the person, they rather focus on the sexual values, communicable values of, of the person. In von Hildebrand, by contrast, and this was brought out um, very ably by Maria, um, the emotions are, uh, or at least can be, uh, can be genuinely personal uh, realities. Um, they can be um, responses to high values. Already that term, responses, is different. Uh, if Wojtyla talks about reactions, uh, the emotions are reactions to the um, importance or, or somehow the attractiveness or goodness of um, things we, we, we perceive. So um, that, I think, is the, is the main difference. For von Hildebrand, the emotions are intentionally related to the object at hand. Therefore, they are rational. Um, they, they are um, responses of the person, not free responses. They're still spontaneous. I, I can't just bring them into being. But they are, you could say, my take on, my response to the world uh, around me in general, and of course, my response to this individual person in front of me. So. Many of the distinctions that Wojtyla also makes, and makes in the level of the will, um, uh, von Hildebrandt makes uh, on the level of the heart, already in the emotions. For instance, um, the distinction between using and loving, uh, which um, von Hildebrandt makes, I mean, uh, which Wojtyla makes in von Hildebrandt already is present in the emotions themselves. So. He, dis he would distinguish, for instance, between lust and love. Excuse me, uh, but let's stay with the, with the topic. Um, lust and love as a, as a distinction between two very different sorts of emotions. Lust is, the, is uh, motivated by the merely subjectively satisfying by the person of the other sex insofar as uh, he or she can be used to satisfy um, my desire for pleasure. Whereas love is the value response that's awakened by the beauty and ability and worthiness of that same person, right? So the distinction here uh, doesn't yet refer to the will. It is a distinction within the emotional level. And that distinction uh, between these value responding emotions and um, the, 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 uh, the affection of the emotions or the, the hankerings or desires that we have for the merely subjectively satisfying, that distinction is crucial as you saw in his uh, treatment of the heart. Um, also, the transcendence that von Hildebrand, uh, that um, Wojtyla ascribes to the will, especially in so far as the will is the faculty in us that can, correspond, that can respond to the individuality of the person, that you find in von Hildebrand too, but you find it already on the realm of the emotions. Love is not a response to some quality. No, love is precisely, as we've seen uh, several times, a response to the individual person in front of us. So the, the will, the, 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 the integrating activity of the will isn't necessary here uh, because the heart already includes that. And there it seems to me 
Well, I, I guess in general, my view is that von Hildebrand's um, phenomenology of the emotion of life is really much more rich and refined than what you find in, uh, in Wojtyla. So I think on the whole, I make these contrasts. On the whole, I think um, von Hildebrand is um, uh, truer to the, to the experience of the heart. Also, objectivity, to mention one more. Uh, I think there, too, the, um, the objectivity that Wojtyla is looking for and for which he relies very much on the will and the intellect that objectivity you also find in Van Hildebrand in the emotions themselves. Uh, an emotion can be adequate to uh, something it sees or not, right? So indifference towards a beautiful person is an inadequate uh, emotion, whereas admiration is a more adequate one. Love might be a more adequate one, and so on. Or lust is inadequate. It's a, it's a utilitarian emotion towards a person who ought to be loved for his or her own sake. So that adequacy to the reality um, uh, that are the object of the emotion is already, to a large extent, um, in the emotions as von Hildebrand understands them. And that, uh, part, that insight, I think, uh, contributes to his rich analysis of human affectivity. Um, all right, I'm skipping a few points here. Maybe the next important point to make is um, regarding the spontaneity of the emotions. Wojtyla, uh, as we saw, sees this largely as a negative. That is to say, largely as a reason for viewing these emotions as a below the level of the person. It is what, what originates in our free initiating activity uh, as persons that can be called truly uh, personal. Now, von Hildebrand, as we saw this morning, sees this spontaneity not necessarily as a negative. It's a way in which our deeper self can manifest uh, itself um, in our experience and in our responses. So, Maybe it's a good way of putting it is this, that for Van Hildebrand, it's not just the body that has these spontaneous and instinctual, out of control um, urges and reflexes and reactions, out of control, not in the sense of wacky, but in the sense of not uh, initiated by the will. Um, but he, he says that our own personhood, not just the body, the lower levels, but our very being as persons is so deep that uh, the, the, by far the largest part of it is, uh, is below or, or above or beyond, let's say, uh, the free activity of our willing at, or, between, or, or beyond the, the range of our knowing. So we are much more, much higher, much deeper than what we know or, or can control. That was an essential aspect and I think a very true and beautiful um, insight that comes out in that eighth chapter on the, on the heart as the deeper self of the person. Perhaps it's a good idea to read at least one section of that on page uh, 70 of the heart. Um, it's the, the, the first full paragraph. And Hildebrand there says, Typical of man's createdness is the existence of a depth dimension of his soul which does not fall under his mastery as do his volitional acts. Man is greater and deeper than the range of things he can control with his free will. His being reaches into mysterious depths which go far beyond what he can engender or create. Nothing expresses this fact more adequately, perhaps, than the truth that God is nearer to us than we are to ourselves. And this applies not only to the supernatural level, but also analogously to the natural sphere. These affections of the higher level, then, are truly gifts, natural gifts of God, which man cannot give himself by his own power. Coming as they do from the very depth of his person, they are, in a specific way, voices of his true self, voices of his full personal being. 
Um, so notice at the end of the paragraph, they are voices of our true self, and yet we couldn't possibly give them by our own strength. It is something deep down in ourselves that is that that um, that we need, as it were, grace or, or help or, or the the presence of a beloved to bring it out. So so the heart, as it were, if we are in the presence of someone uh, beautiful, someone we fall in love with, what, how we that is often experienced as um, a quickening of our own personhood. Our own self comes alive. Our own selfhood is awakened. Uh, not, and we couldn't do that by ourselves. What's required is precisely the presence of this other person that calls uh, to the deeper selves in us and that awakens it. So, so that, I think, is, is um, again, I think a very deep uh, a thought and, and a true thought, true to our experience of love in um, von Hildebrand. So this spontaneity, then, and uh, Damien Federica, who's not here right now, made the point last when was it yesterday, I think, uh, mentioned this experience of spontaneity in love is usually, if it's true love, felt as a liberation. It's, uh, it's felt as a flowering of the self, not as an urge which takes over, uh, but as a flowering, a liberation of the self. And perhaps one more point about this, and maybe that should be the last one so I don't hog the conversation too much. Um, is this, that um, it's also very often experienced like that by both by the person who undergoes the love, who, who experiences it, and by the object of the love. Um, so, let's see, to make it concrete, if, if uh, I bring my wife a cup of coffee in the morning, uh, then she's very lucky that morning. <laughs> if I bring her a cup of coffee in the morning, then I could do that out of sheer commitment. I know she really wants a cup of coffee. I need her to get out of bed, <laughs> so I better bring her a cup of coffee. So here, my act of the will is very much uh, doing something that is, if my motivation is, is good, it's an act of love. But I make myself do it. Now, if uh, I come home uh, from, from I don't know what, and I see her and I smile, um, then that is experienced in a very different way. Then that is experienced as a spontaneous response and therefore much more telling, as it were, of my true, um, not just feelings for her, my, but my true love for her, right? I can grit my teeth and do something, which is good and in accordance with love, but I can't grit my teeth and smile like that spontaneously. So what the, what the involuntary... Uh, nature of the emotions. The spontaneity of the emotions does, I think, is reveal in some way the truth about the person. Not the moral truth, not what he wants to be, uh, but what is already there in the person, in, in um, his heart. So, as uh, Roger Scruton, who wrote a great book on uh, sexual desire, uh, says at one point, the, the beloved, if I smile or blush when she comes in, the beloved will feel that response as her doing. I am not making myself do it through my own will. The beloved will feel as if she is the cause of, of my blushing. And that is a gift all its own. And I think it, it says a lot about the nature of the heart and also about uh, the fact that it is a voice of our true and deeper self, something which is out of the reach of our um, free will. I'm going to go back on my promise. I want to make one more point. And then, uh, but it's basically, you already made it, John Henry. I, I did want to say something about the fact that um, one advantage of making the distinction between the heart and the will is precisely uh, the, the, the idea that it, it, it allows us So the voice of the heart can diverge, can be very different from the voice of the will. The will submits, the will gives its fiat, and yet the heart weeps and suffers under it and might, might really cry, might ask God why. 
did you ask me to do this? Uh, why did you make me suffer this? And yet I resign myself to God's will all along. So this divergence, which makes the response truly human, uh, I couldn't find it right now in the heart, but uh, there are definitely places in the religious writings of Dietrich von Hildebrand where he explains that this, this fact, that our heart can give a different response than our will, different from just submitting, is one way in which we can see that God allows us to have a full, unique, personal life. We are not just um, tools or instruments of his will uh, required to sort of march lockstep in, uh, in line with his will. That's maybe not a very good word, but nevertheless, uh, we are uh, supposed to have our own responses also to God. So our unique individuality um, can unfold itself in a much richer way, um, a much more personalist way, if we um, see in uh, our religious life more than just an obedience with, uh, of the will to God's uh, commands and or an acceptance to what is happening. We can give a response of our own to these um, experiences. Okay, um, so, and that then, of course, is linked to this whole notion of the cross that came up yesterday. Uh, what was his name, Bishop um, Zizulas? Zizulas. 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 Uh, that, that criticism that the cross is not there in von Hildebrand's idea of love, I think, uh, well, I think a lot could be said to the contrary of that. Uh. All right, good. So maybe that's enough to... Um, open up some discussion and give rise to more questions. And now, if Thomas Aquinas and Dieter van Hilbert want to come <laughs> sit down, or, or, or just stay where you are, I don't, whatever you want. Maybe, uh, more um, because I was somewhat okay, so struck. We can be obedient to God, to what we believe is the moral, like what God wants for us. Um, that can be our response and our will. But while we're feel, feeling something different, you know, our emotions are telling us something different, but we, you know, in our, our reason, we can understand that that's not the best choice to act on that. And you were saying that. We, you were saying it doesn't ha we don't have to be in that lockstep um, because we can make our own response. So I'm just trying to understand, is our own response acting on our emotions or just understanding that we have our emotions but still doing what we believe is the right yeah. thing our will? Saying that, uh, that it's our own response, response is maybe not... Uh, very precise. Obviously, the, the resignation of the will, the submission of the will to God is also our own response. Uh, it, so what I mean more is that um, this, uh, this duality in the response that I can submit but don't need to be happy about it, uh, that allows a kind of breath in our, in our, in our own person, personal response to God, making room not just for obedience, um, but for um, a whole range of uh, responses that are uh, both possible, uh, legitimate, and even, von Hildebrand argues, uh, wanted by God. It's not as if, let's, I think he uses the example of uh, Isaac and Abraham, it's not as if Abraham's response would have been more perfect if he had been delighted to sacrifice his son, if he had not been uh, sad about that. So. So there is something about um, God wants that he wants more than just a kind of linear um, walking in his ways, a linear following of his uh, commands and the realities he, he, uh, he, he uh, confronts us with.
but he wants this additional personal response, and that, that response is, um, is, can of course be different um, um, depending on who's, who's responding. Yeah. But perhaps, yeah. Uh, I, I think uh, maybe an example of what Jules means would be if, let's say, some terrible tragedy befalls you, say, a child is killed in an accident and you grieve over that. Uh, I think what Jules means is that your acceptance of that uh, uh, as coming from God doesn't uh, discredit your grief, or it's not as if your acceptance would be better if you didn't grieve at all. Uh, that that natural human grief over a lost child needs to find its affective voice, and uh, that, uh, that that's the, dis that's the discrepancy between drinking that cup, you might say, to the end and feeling the pain and accepting it. You, you see the conflict in St. Augustine's description of the death of Monica, where he wants to accept this and grief. Soul has gone home, but he's overwhelmed with grief. And, and in, in Augustine, there's a bit of a tendency to be ashamed of his grief, you know, as if his acceptance ought to completely take over. But I think you're saying that Will and the heart, when they diverge like that, each have their own place. If I, if I understand you perfectly. <laughs> Does anybody know what Voisin is about that? Or Thomas Aquinas, for that matter? Yes. Well, that's what I was just going to say. Are you saying that von Hildebrand or Witte would not, would not agree with that? Um, I'm saying that they would say that it's a lockstep, it's only the will? No, no, no. That's one reason why I regret using the lockstep. Uh, that that's, seems to be more severe. But I do, I, what, I, what I do think is that um, that phenomena is articulated philosophically in a, in a, to me at least, very satisfying, convincing way. Um, whereas if, if you don't have the heart, if you have the will, and therefore the will must be obedient, then, then what do you do with, with the rest of that? And, and, and perhaps, I don't know the passage, well, I do know from, this, from the Confessions, no? Um, so I know it uh, from a long time ago. Um, that, that, that tension in, in Augustine shows, I think, what the sort of, um, the, the sort of, uh, uh, what it can lead to psychologically if you don't make that distinction. I see it much more nowadays, I think, there is, in, in sometimes, I encounter in Christians the, um, an oversimplification of accepting the reality that God puts in your place. I mean, uh, when, when a suffering comes and then immediately, but I'm, I'm glad, I'm very happy, my child died, but everything's wonderful because he, he, she or she's in heaven, and so on, without, it seems to me, allowing due uh, time and, and space for the... Um, true experiencing of the grief of that, even though uh, recognizing at the same time that, that that is, of course, like everything else, in God's plan and in his perfect providence. Could I speak to Thomas? Because I, in different he, He's not here. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was just joking. <laughs> <laughs> because in hearing what you're saying and how von Hildebrand says it, I would say Thomas would say very much exactly the same even though he won't identify it as heart, he speaks of the passions. And I know some, what I'm hearing sometimes is like the negative of the passions. Thomas does not see the passions as negative at all. And the passions are very human. And so in response to a tragedy, yes, my will may have to say yes to God, and my passions also respond. And that's the fully integrated person is where those passions have to have that virtue of accepting. But, but there's that natural response of sorrow, which is good. And there's nothing wrong with that. Even though I say yes to God, there's nothing wrong with that grief and that sorrow. That's a true passion, Thomas would say. I, don't, I, I, I am one of those who hasn't read Aquinas on the Passions. So, uh, but, but, but I wonder mm -hmm. if um, you find in Aquinas that same um, elevation of the passion so that they in, the, in and of themselves aren't just human, but genuinely personal, and that is to say that they are as spiritual a response to the to the reality as the resignation of the will is. My 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 uh, suspicion is that um, 
you would find that it's totally natural, that it is even good, that it, that's an expression of human nature and so on, but nevertheless, that is somehow uh, uh, not quite as central, not quite as, um, uh, it doesn't have the perfection of a personal response. And, and if, if that's the case, then I think from that point of view, from Hildebrand's analysis is superior. But maybe, uh, just take it if you want it. <laughs> I'm actually also wondering because Vaitiva is so much in line with Thomas Aquinas, and in him, I mean, the the little I don't I don't know him, you know, it's been a while since I've studied him, but it doesn't seem to me that he gives affectivity that place, ever give affectivity that place, and so I don't know though maybe maybe Aquinas I mean would you say that Aquinas? What I would say my understanding of reading von Hildebrand is that what he's done is taken part of virtue putting that virtue into affectivity. Where Thomas would say, yes, it is that there is virtue in those passions, which is where the personalism comes in. Mm -hmm. That there are the passions themselves, but then there is the virtue in the irascible appetite, in those passions. And that's the personalism that von Hildebrand is, that, in, in reading it, that's what I'm seeing in my understanding of it. That von Hildebrand's making some different distinctions, but really what he's done is taken virtue and put it as mere affectivity. Whereas Thomas, to see that Thomas has the passions here, but those passions are raised to another level, which in that you see the richness of what von Hildebrand is, is saying. So I wouldn't say the passions per se, but the virtue in the passion. That, that jives very well with Portiwa's analysis, no? Yes. yes. I, and I, that's, so that's why I would say that positive is there. It's, it's just that von Hildebrand's already brought something of the will, it seems, into where Thomas, Thomas and what Tito would say, there's already something of the will involved that brings the passions to that level. I don't know if that makes sense, but. Yeah, I see three, at least three questions. Yeah, I was just wondering what, um, if you could speak to what happens when, if you do just sort of like accept, accept the tragedy and, and like if you don't acknowledge the feeling. Well, <laughs> I mean, that's a large topic, and I, I, I can't really say anything authoritative about it, except um, it does seem to me that it, um, the person st tends to shrivel uh, under that. It bo it's both an expression of a, of a kind of um, a lack of depth, I think, in the person. Um, and it, and it facilitates that. So, um, one uh, one chapter that comes to mind in von Hildebrand is, uh, I think, it's in Transformation of Christ, where he distinguishes between true simplicity, and I don't know what term he uses for the other the, the, the kind of the, the simplicity or simplifying or oversimplification with, with which it's often um, confused. So. Uh, to to try to too quickly to pass over the grief, the human, fully legitimate, natural, and expected emotions, and sort of force yourself into line with what you think is the right response, uh, that that would eventually have all sorts of psychological uh, consequences. That maybe there's somebody else who could speak more about it than I can, but I do think it sort of cramps the person um, uh, and. Uh, makes the person shrivel a little bit. Uh, plus, I think very often it comes back to haunt the person because, it, because the response is really there. And unless it is given, uh, you might tell yourself, I, I've dealt with this and I'm in line with God, but then maybe a year later it comes up again. Uh, I, one one um, area where I think this, this often happens is in the area of forgiveness. Uh, where, where also, in a similar way, it's very often said it's, a, it's an act of the will and then that is understood um, in, in a very facile way in which what you do is you just say, I forgive you, and you're done. Now you're you know, in right harmony again with your neighbor and so on. 
And the truth is that almost always, if it's been a, a real hurt, that will manifest itself. If not then, then, then later. So I don't know. That's at least one, uh, one response. Could I add just one thing? <clears throat> I'm not sure. I mean, a superficial aspect of the person, maybe I would, I would um, say, I mean, it can be a coping mechanism. I think that very often it is a kind of a self-defense mechanism because I think that I do very much believe that we're very vulnerable, especially in, of course, I mean, if in line with when Hil what Von Hildebrand says, of course, we're very vulnerable because that is somehow the deepest, most intimate part of ourselves. And so I think that, I mean, that would be one reason why one would kind of shut it down. And I do think that, I mean, as much as I have things that I don't appreciate in sort of early... 20th century psychology. I mean, there are certain things about sublimination or repression, I mean, that I think are very valuable in the sense that precisely what can happen is a very bizarre and on so many deeper levels and so much more obscure, like it just becomes simply more and more complex. But, I mean, there are certain situations where, I mean, again, I think of the concentration camps or something like that, where, I mean, that was simply a survival mechanism was to shut down affectivity and to simply will to survive, so to speak, yeah? And I mean, not to allow yourself to grieve in the face of all of this, you know? So I mean, it's, it, it's understandable sometimes that that's, what's hap that's what happens. I think one good example is um, in the abortion area, when women have an abortion, they've convinced themselves, like deep down, we think that they there has to be some part of them that grieves and knows what has happened to them. But because they have told themselves, it's a little bit different than what you're saying, but they've told themselves it's fine, they've justified it, but we, we see in 10, 20, 30 years, whether it's the birth of another child or something else, even though they might have seemed fine after that trauma, because they told themselves that there was nothing wrong with it, it then hits them and they're crippled by it. Like you said, I thought shrivel was a good word because then all of a sudden it, it comes up because it's, it's just laying in heaven usually. Well, the usually. You had a question? Uh, I, I saw Jesse, I thought before Jesse was right behind Gerard. Oh, um, I was in Spices. Oh, and very good conversation. It's been Oh, yeah, Jess. Well, um, you know, Dr. Carl, you mentioned St. Augustine's confessions, and earlier on in the confessions, remember, one of his friends dies, yeah. and he's really upset. And he's so upset that he, does, he loses the interest in everything. And I think one of his points in there is to show that he had reached a level of spiritual growth and detachment from the things of this world that. Even though, as you rightly said, he does express like he's upset about this, but his detachment is seen as a sign of like psychological health and spiritual advancement at that point. I'm not saying he's right and Ron Hogan uh, is wrong or something like that, but like, it's sort of present. It's one of the things that he presents as a model. Maybe it is restricted by classical ideas of psychology and health, is that emotions are under control to such a degree that he is not like hysterical about his mother's death there. And it seems that there's a marked like break or contrast with uh, the uh, with Hill right now and, and uh, the point of the issue. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think Von Hildebrand would have probably said to St. Augustine, you needn't be ashamed about okay. grieving for your mother's death. There is a certain uh, uh, feeling of uh, uh, regrettable weakness that he yielded. And, and so the, this um, repression of the feeling doesn't just, it, it certainly comes as a defense mechanism, a coping mechanism, as you say, but it can also come from a kind of overwrought spirituality. You know, that uh, means that the affirmation of the will has to dominate everything in any kind of divergent uh, effective response is somehow uh, a regrettable uh, weakness. Yeah, I think if I remember correctly, St. Augustine's example actually addresses itself to Samantha because if I remember right, he doesn't allow himself to be charges himself for being sad, but then comes the point 
or it just takes him over and he does weep, and only then does he find that supernatural peace. You know, he, he, he describes it. So that seems to prove exactly what, um, what you were saying, that, that there's a place for the emotional response that is absolutely necessary for the focus of the humanity of the person. Otherwise, even the right respondent the response of the will is really the heart problem. It's the two us of the So Thomas also discusses this, that our right, the right response to sadness, should we repress, should we pretend that we're at school, should we weep, and should we just take a bath and take to sleep? <laughs> and sister will give the reference to the very same question. Uh, St. Thomas is, um, there's questions where he deals with sadness things. And should we take a bath and go to sleep? Uh, is it good to cry? Um, is it good to repress or pretend we're merciful and we're sad? Um, I, you know, very much what did you say? You <laughs> can't just say yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just encouraging you to read it. <laughs> You know, I, it strikes me that as 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 um, I remember at one point reflecting upon, so the the kind of how when we when we try to cope with things or when we shut down our emotions and how sometimes that's called a self defense mechanism, that it is in fact a way that we I mean we do so often if we want to protect ourselves or if we want to disable other persons from accessing us, isn't that the first place that we go? You know, that, that intimate part of ourselves, like if we don't want to... And then, I mean, of course, there, there can be this false ideal of perfection or strength that, you know, I, I shan't, I, I shouldn't show any weakness, I should always be strong, and hence, you know... But that somehow there is something almost depersonalizing. It seems that when the emotions... And I can do this to myself, you know, where, where I shut it down and thereby d disable other person's access to my most intimate part. And then also... I really impoverish my own life. And so again, it would be, I would be very intrigued in Aquinas, who, who again, unfortunately, I have, I, I, that, that would be something we'd have to delve into. But I mean, not just Aquinas, just in general, it seems to me that that's something that I find very, um, very interesting and intriguing in Hildebrand because it seems so true to experience. Yeah. Yes. I was um, just going to say, it's, it's interesting too in the, Perspective of uh, love being a valid response. You perceive the the unique value of the individual. The more you perceive that, even though it's it's not as much as God knows is is within the individual. The more you perceive that, the more closer to God's vision of that individual that you have in a sense. And so, then so so with love is that response when you have that that particular individual in your life, and then. Whenever, and it's a tragic situation such as when there's the, the death of that individual, the response to that, it's not, um, it's not that sorrow is separate from love. Sorrow is love in that situation where you have that individual there, but now that individual obviously is in a way that you cannot access. And so, um, and as a thing, of course, if the more you love, the closer you are to, to understanding God's approach to life and what God wants for you. So then, whenever that immense love is no longer there, then that's the more you're going to sorrow from that. And that's also our understanding with them, why we meditate on, on our sorrow for mother. Because who loved Jesus more than his own mother, who would have grieved more at the thought of the death of her son. Even though she knows that something, you know, even though she knows that death is not the end. And yet, 
there's the reality that death is strangely not natural or strangely an interruption of what the human experience should be. That actually reminds me of something also when you had spoken that it seems almost as if we're giving two responses. I mean, that somehow the, the richness of Hildebrand is that we can give those two simultaneous responses, you know, the one of the will to the, in a kind of a submission to the obedience, but then that grief really precisely is a response to that loss and that interruption. So somehow it enables a very deep, it seems, um, twofold kind of response to two things that are both happening at that very moment. I think, I think it's identifying what it's just the nature of the situation. It's the same objective value that you're responding to as the nature of the situation being completely on end. You know, whereas whenever you're involved in, in that love, you know, as we understand it normally, as we come to know it, that's the, the happy, you know, hallmark, you know, experience, you know, as, as we, like, just kind of blindly accept because it's so wonderful. But then, on that flip side, it's the, the deeper you go into that love, and that love in this tragic situation is the most miracle thing that you can experience. So, um, so it, it's, it ends up being that the deeper the pain, that's not something to flee from because that's that's the nature of the beautiful reality that we experience. I'm sorry. Yeah, I just might add that Von Hildebrand often comments on the raising of Lazarus, you know, the tears of Christ at the tomb of Lazarus, even though he knew he was about to raise him. Von Hildebrand would often say, and remember it very forcefully, no Christian is obliged to be more stoical in the face of suffering than the God man. Yes, Chase. Is that, excuse me. You, uh, uh, um, I'm just wondering if what von Hildebrand would have thought of the, the temperaments, the idea of the, the four temperaments and whether each one is maybe just a skewed uh, response to value in a sense. And uh, I guess, is that just a component of one's personality, which doesn't have a, a value? Or is it a, a slight defect that we would attempt to overcome in the spiritual life? Now, what do you mean by, by temperament? You mean like, like lethargy like, or irascible or choleric? Right. I guess you mean like saying we're melancholy. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. He talks about it briefly in terms of theory, doesn't he? Yes, he does. Yes. Temperamental dispositions in contrast to virtues. That's right. But, you know, that seems to be more of a dispositional thing. Uh, maybe not a, a, an effective response, but uh, a particular disposition. Or some irascible, or anger, melancholy toward other, but uh, and, and, and as dispositional, I think both Wojtyla and von Hildebrand would concur. This is somehow subpersonal or pre-personal. There's no you know, sanctioned uh, act of the person yet uh, in the mere possession of or feeling the uh, perhaps also, I think they wouldn't think of it as a weakness, um, but as uh, part of the richness of, of humanity and therefore complementary complementary um, dispositions. So, so it's not it's not a, it's not too bad that we're all suffering these various uh, handicaps of. I often think of that uh, because I'm a phlegmatic, and there are no phlegmatic saints, apparently. <laughs> so, so clearly, I happen to have the one temperament that is a bit of a weakness. And, but my wife, my, my wife had a little urgent Facebook call. She wanted to uh, exchange her melancholy temperament for a phlegmatic after the wedding because she couldn't sleep and I was just fine. <laughs> so, um, in any case, the point is I don't think it's a weakness. Uh, it's a, it's a, a complementarity, analogous to the sexes, but of course not nearly as you know, thoroughgoing or anything like that. But um, 
but uh, we, we, the world is happier for the phlegmatics and the melancholies and the cholerics and the what's the other sanguines. I thought Peter was a sanguine. You just have a prejudice. Glad you mentioned it. I think I didn't make this point, but that's one thing I think that needs to be said. That this, um, that if Van Hildebrand does, um, in several ways, as you already mentioned during your presentation, um, talk about the the role of the will <coughs> to uh, step in when the value response, which could be thoroughly objective, but when it fails, when it somehow uh, d it doesn't quite meet the mark and then uh, through indirect influence or, or by simply disavowing it if I can't keep it from uh, spontaneously arising uh, or sanctioning it when it's good, um, the will remains, um, perhaps you could say, the guardian of, of objectivity. The will and the intellect together uh, judge whether or not my heart is responding properly. Th th this, this um, I think, this distinction I mentioned earlier between the deeper self that's beyond the range of our immediate knowledge and our immediate free will, uh, of course, that deeper self is not entirely out of the range of our knowledge and free will. We, we ought to try as much as we can to govern ourselves and, and get a hold of our deeper selves as well, and, to, and we have to come to know ourselves, not just superficially, but ever more deeply. And so I think in that... Um, in that the intellect and the will have a, a very important role. So I think that's what you meant, but, but maybe not. There is, in other words, a, a, a very important role for the will to, to guide and um, correct the movements of the heart uh, when, when they occur. And when, when there's the need for correction, I think that then also has to be the questioning. In other words, this, this movement of the heart, even if it's false, you recognize it as as, as, as a no good reaction, um, then uh, it's a revelation of something inside of you. you. It ought to be the occasion of asking, now why, why would I feel this when obviously something else is demanded? Is there something in my past? Does this reveal an area of sin? Or, you know, so, so even in that case, where the, where the will clearly needs to step in um, and make some adjustments and try to improve my, my deeper self, uh, it's still very important to know and not to not not as it were to devour it too quickly. Okay, this is wrong, gone. I've disavowed it. No, where did that come from? That's the question you should ask, and and I think uh, then work on work through. Well, did that get to your question or? or well, I think it was kind of to show there is similarity on Hildebrand to Wojtyla. Yes. Maybe um, on the side of Wojtyla, are there similarities in his um, insistence on an objective truth underlying love to value response? I mean, I, I would, I, I definitely think so because, I mean, it's just simply, I think that Wojtyla doesn't um, make the, dis, the 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 sort of manifold distinctions that that uh, Hildebrand does. But when he speaks of that objectivity, I mean, I think that you could supplement Hildebrand's usage of the term value there when he speaks of the objectivity of truth. So, I mean, they're both thinking of the same thing. And I think that throughout, I mean, you showed that, I mean, or that, that maybe in your questions that'll come out more. 
it, sometimes it's just a matter of the terminological difference, but really, I mean, there is a deep kinship between, um, despite their differences, there are many, I think, central key factors as you try to show that where, where there is, they're on the same page, I mean, they mean something very similar. That's how Did you yeah. want to say that, right? Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. That too, yes. But, and also one other thing uh, on your question about this truth about the person uh, and how that's common to Kiva and von Hildebrand. But there's one idea in von Hildebrand that seems to me to be a very helpful addition to Voitiva. And that is when Voitiva talks about this dignity of the person, which is the real heart of love, even in the love between man and woman, uh, it really becomes love when the one sees the dignity of the other as person and affirms that. Well, uh, that, that seems to would seem to Van Hildebrand to be an incomplete analysis for this reason, that the dignity of the person, in a sense, is the same for everybody. You know, I keep that in mind when I practice love of neighbor. I remember whoever it is that I encounter, there's the dignity of the person here. Respect is due, and so on. But Van Hildebrand brings to light that there's not only a dignity the same in everyone, that uh, provides this backbone of love, but also the particular uh, unrepeatable self uh, uh, of the beloved person, especially in the case of uh, the love between man and woman. The love of neighbor, you don't have to go beyond the dignity, which is the same in everyone. But with the love between man and woman, this very particular personal beauty uh, is the foundation. Now, it's real, it's objective, there's a norm of truth here, but it's not exactly the same as what is meant by this dignity of the person, which comes off also in the Voidiva text, in my mind, as a very intellectual kind of thing. You know, you feel desire, you feel sympathy, but then with the intellect, you know that each has this dignity. Now, uh, I think one needs to acknowledge, in addition, this, um, this unique sight of beauty proper to this beloved person. And I, I, I doubt that it's the same kind of intellectual understanding. There it seems to me you've got the more affective kind of understanding because it's value under the aspect of, of the beautiful. Uh, so I think you can then bring the heart in and a certain cognitive power of it. It goes on notice in Tukiba when you explain how that um, Proper to the beloved person is experienced. Well, that's uh, uh, a point uh, where I think I, I see that Miller Brand complimenting and adding something important to uh, the team. I think it is important, especially because he says that um, it's in directing love at a person, the person, doesn't yeah. it? In this passage, and that we overcome that tendency that we I don't mean on a purely sexual level where those same qualities are in other women or are in other men. It's precisely in that integration in, in, in the will directed to the person as person that, that, that individuality is a work. Maybe it doesn't make so much, so much of it.
Yeah, no, she was pointing out that more pastoral focus yeah. of, uh, of, of his work, uh, focusing on you know, the red that happened right there. Exhaust his, you know, as you find it in any person. And then you have to not yet to the full value foundation of the love between man and woman. yesterday who was claiming that uh, there's no room in, in uh, on Hildebrand for the cross. No. And it would seem to me that when we're talking about the passion and the will and how they confront pain of loss, we're talking about the cross. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, that's a good point. That's a good connection back to that uh, discussion. It, yes, it seems that way anyway. Yeah. yeah. No, that uh, uh, makes a lot of sense as soon as you say it. Uh, the cross, I mean, it's as if the middle man is saying, you know, you've got to drink the chalice. It's more pushing it aside or invasion of uh, the cross. Yeah, there were other questions. Uh, Amanda, did you? No. Uh, I, I uh, wonder if I should maybe mention another point that I would have mentioned before, uh, and that is one strength, it seems to me, in um, Wojtyla, and I'd like everyone to think about this for a minute and see if there's something to it, is, is that precisely what in some ways I think is a weakness, that the emotions are considered on the animal level. He talks about the sexual urge. That's a word I think very foreign to Van Hildebrand um, because he likes to think of, of the emotion in terms of being motivated even though he recognizes the others. Uh, I wonder if uh, the, the, the one strength of Wojtyla isn't precisely the, the, the greater place that he gives for these, the, the sexual urge, the, the, the natural inclinations, the nature and the sexual difference between uh, men and women in, uh, in the, the origin or explanation of reasons for uh, love arising. Um, so he speaks about one reason why uh, we, we are so susceptible to the sexual values of the other person, both bodily but also femininity, masculinity, is because of this, um, how characteristic the sexual urge is for the human person in general. And so um, just like Yesterday it came up, I think you, you made the point, John, that um, in uh, the love between parents and children, it seems there you need more than just a value response to explain that love. There, 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 there clearly is some um, tie into the biological uh, connection, which is, of course, always more than just biological, but the natural biological connection, and that explains, at least to some extent, the reason why I love my children in a way that's very different from the way in which I love other children. And um, I, I think that what you said there about the love between parents and children, something similar seems to also be true about the love between husband and wife. There's more going on there than just the value response. There's also a kind of working out of that um, existential um, 
order of things and the way in which God has designed um, the, the, uh, the, the furtherance of the human race and the, the, the procreation of human persons that we, that we somehow, our loves are embedded in and grow out of, uh, at least to some extent, of, the, uh, of this natural uh, biological phenomena. To, um, I would actually maybe even venture even more deep or more deeply more more further and say I wonder sometimes if even I mean it seems to me that reading Harry Frankfurt um, I'm wondering whether or not even by Tiwa like even if if there might not be a level even lower that could also play in I mean even when he talks about sensual um, I mean between man I mean, if you could, if you could possibly explain Harry Frankfurt's explanation of love, because there is something, you know, what we would call chemistry or whatever. If I mean, might one consider that, and how that also, you know, plays in? Again, not that that's the driving force, or that that's, you know, true love, but that those things. I mean, husband does not, I mean, speak of that per se, and it would just be interesting. I don't know. I might have pushed him <laughs> too much to, to go even. Yeah. Perhaps more. <laughs> yes, Chase. Um, I was wondering if you could speak to the relation of Wojtyla and Hildebrand to Kant, because it seems that Wojtyla seems um, rather sympathetic to Kant, but Hildebrand seems to be in reaction, following Shiro to Kant, in reaction very much so. Especially to the uh, discouragement of the affections and uh, the, yeah. you know, the dominance of the will. Yeah. If that was very foreign to uh, von Hildebrand, that um, severe uh, austerity of the Kantian ethics, and the uh, elimination of uh, inclination in all its forms, feeling, uh, allowing for nothing but a resolute duty centered will. Uh, uh, on the other hand, von Hildebrand uh, greatly admires this theme of moral obligation in the Kant uh, and uh, plays a large role in his own thought. Uh, the idea that uh, certain what he called morally relevant values don't just appeal to us and draw us as lovable, but make urgent moral demand. So uh, moral obligation, uh, moral imperative, uh, that becomes a great theme in the brand of the part arises in Kant. And uh, Wojtyla too makes a lot of duty and obligation in the act in person. Uh, it's, it's clear that this is a fact that we're subject to moral obligation is extremely important for our person. <coughs> So uh, they both um, receive from Kant, both Wojtyla and from Hildebrand, uh, this idea of this unconditional moral imperative, this almost divine solemnity and urgency. It's taken very seriously in their account of the human person. A lot more can be said. That's what first comes to mind. Do you want I mean, they would very strongly react to Kant on his idea of person, of course. I mean, both Wojtyla and um, and uh, Hildebrand. I mean, that kind of material reality, or that. I mean, because Kant reduces the person really to one of his ideas, um, and so that's something that they would very strongly resist. Um, he has a whole the way he sets up. Numenon phenomenon. I mean, that that that's something that I think both of them would very strongly reject, and and they really tried to counter with a deep new. And I think really Shayla was the one who very much spearheaded that movement um, in the last century with his um, with his big book on that. Yeah. Uh, but also in Kant, there is this personalist principle. You know, the person is never to be used as a mere means; always to be for this is all and that uh, was very dear to both of them. They, they felt that Kant uh, uh, was moving into much deeper uh, personalist waters than he was. Uh, approach. Yeah. 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 Yeah
So in the pure reason versus the practical reason. Yeah. In the pure reason, he really sets it up in a way it's very discouraging. But in the practical reason, despite the fact, I mean, and this is what's so intriguing in philosophers, I mean, he has this brilliant, deep, deep insight, and yet he really at that point has kind of worked himself into a pickle because he can't, I mean, he uses the language, and the language is 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 very strong, and 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 um, he he definitely sees the truth, but he can't um, he can't flesh it out per se, and that's something that uh, would would you agree with that Hildebrand and NYT have really tried to do very deeply, um, and I mean in Kant, of course, it, this is particularly Hildebrand, but in Kant, of course, emotions. I mean Kant, this I mean. He, it's just, I mean, any, where he goes to the point where if you have any emotion, you know, then then no longer are you truly, purely ethical. So for Hildebrand is very strongly reacting against that, right? So emotion for Kant, because it makes it too easy. So Kant has that very strong, his idea of virtue is, and, and you've read the passages where Hildebrand counteracts that his idea of virtue is it requires that effort and it requires that sort of duty drivenness, yeah, which the whole material ethics that Shayla works out is precisely that he tries to enflesh that. He says, no, but there's something good and that's you know, that reality of the good is what gives us the command. So he the the focus is different. It's primarily on the good. From that you understand the command. Whereas for Kant, the command is the highest. I mean I, I love Kant, but in the end and I respect him tremendously, but in the end he I find him incredibly frustrating. Just one clarification, maybe. Um, I didn't mean to apply the same, the same dynamic that's that's manifest in parent-children love to marriage. It'd be a different one. Right. Uh, the, so the comparison would only be on the level of um, of natural impulses, urges, uh, drives, making themselves felt in these in these loves. Not only in the mother-child love or the father-child love, but also in the Spousal love between the two. That there are two. Um, I think that what I was kind of spurring that from was with um, the guy with his, his answer to the half. Um, he does Ferdinand. A, yes, thank you. <laughs> he, he did a, <laughs> <laughs> that was a total guess. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, he, he, did, um, like, he, he started off saying, oh, well, there's um, like, married love falls strong, so I'll just talk about French love. And Frank as Frank. if. Frankfurt. Frankfurt, thank you. Sorry. <laughs> the other guy that's asking that. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so it was. I, I apologize. You know, combination of sources and thoughts. Freely, this pure love and self gift. 
Yeah, thank you. That's true. Uh, also, in the analysis of shame, in love and responsibility, you find something very similar. Although, I think it, there is some, still a, <clears throat> a difference in that. Uh, in the one, uh, for instance, in the shame, it, it is a mechanism that reveals something which underlies it. Uh, whereas in Hildebrand, I think, in general, speaks more of the affections and emotions as, in and of themselves, expressing being. Uh, the, the the response of the person. So, so I I think overall, like like we've all said, there is this great harmony, and many of the insights are present in both thinkers. And but how exactly they're rooted in the underlying uh, metaphysics or, or philosophy of the person is, I think, often somewhat different. And that, of course, uh, is part of why it's so uh, rewarding to compare and contrast uh, and bring them together. Kevin, I found it helpful, Jules, earlier when you pointed out uh, Carol Waitia's pastoral intention. I think here as he's describing uh, how they're coming to love, he's pointing out some tendencies of disillusionment, uh, which are good uh, for, for us to be aware of practically. And talking about the importance of community, our friends and our family can keep us honest and, and help us avoid that, that disillusionment. Um, I think uh, maybe where uh, von, von Hildebrand here um, is, is unique and distinct is, is uh, with the heart, where at least in this section, Carol Ikea seems to be pretty negative on the emotions, that uh, they're uh, something weak, that uh, lack of objectivity, and uh, need to be really controlled by the intellect and the will. With where there is, it can happen in the reverse, where our, our intellect and will is off, and it's our heart that awakens us. And maybe somebody who's seeking to work their way up the corporate ladder, and they're very focused on that, and then uh, their heart speaks to them, uh, they, they fall in love, and then they begin to realize that it's their intellect and will that, that, uh, that uh, maybe needs some, uh, a change. Uh, that's, that's a good point, because we, we can talk about the will and the intellect as correcting the heart, but of course they, they make mistakes of their own, and uh, therefore it is a kind of um, harmony of each three of them uh, correcting the others when, when there's something off. say negative perhaps in that sense he's, he's not down on the emotions uh, at all yeah. or on, 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 on sex um, uh, I, I th I'm not sure if you use, if you use the word negative um, but, uh, but I would say he, he ranks them lower which is precisely why they need to be integrated that there's nothing in and of themselves negative, it's entirely positive 
uh, and, and a necessary ingredient. Love isn't love if sensuality and sentiment aren't, aren't really present, except in a very extenuated sense, of course, that as we all know, we've talked about the dark night of the soul and the absence of the emotions and so on. So in, in, in some ways, you can still speak of it as love, and in some ways, it's when the strength of love comes out in a particular way, but uh, the fullness of love requires um, sensuality and sentiment. Um, so, uh, neither von Hildebrandt nor I, nor anyone here, I think, would, would say uh, he's, he's negative in a kind of um, Manichaean or uh, puritanical sense. Or, or, Kantian. or Kantian sense, so, exactly. Not, not like <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, one of the points that you had brought up, right, was that um, by way of contrast, but perhaps also by way of similarity, where, where, where Wojtyla talks about how the will has to personalize the emotions. Yeah? The sim, uh, there's the parallel, of course, that for Hildebrand, too, I mean, to make it truly personal, even a positive feeling, you have to sanction it. Yeah? And so, in some sense, th they, there's that parallel, and yet there is a distinction because um, there is something richly personal already in that feeling, precisely of the deeper aspect or the sort of, you know, the, the uh, of another <coughs> part maybe of ourselves. You know, whereas whereas I do think that for Waitiwa, it is something that it has to be lifted up. Yeah, there's more of that elevation. So, I mean, you know, again, it's not. So not to say that they're negative, but that there is a different, it seems, movement at stake. Both times the will, you know, says it's yes or has to embrace and has to cooperate with the with um, emotion, but it's different in both. Yes, Andrew. I may be taking us in a different direction, but I believe in the theology of the body. Um, Motiwa says, and I'm paraphrasing, that one flesh union of man and woman is the foundation of ethics and culture. Is that Jules? I'm going to use you as a check on what I'm saying here. Do you recall that? <laughs> you have to use another <laughs> check because <laughs> this is the way to subjectivism. <laughs> <laughs> Can you repeat that, Andrew? <laughs> Perhaps I'll bring it to the next meeting, okay, the, the quotation. But he makes the point, if I remember correctly, that the one flesh union of man and woman is the foundation of ethics and culture. Now that seems to me to be a very grandiose uh, statement. And uh, I just want, it may not fit in this discussion, However, uh, it also seems to me that it has the capability of drawing a lot of this discussion together into, uh, into that idea. So this was, I'm sorry, I had missed, um, I was distracted before because of time. This is Waitiwa or this is Hildebrand? This is the theology of the body. Theology of the body. I'm not familiar with it, or, or the context, so it could mean any number of things, and I, I, I just can't really comment on it. Yet. I see a message from John Henry here reminding us of the clock and the break. Is that right? And the coffee.